You asked for him, we got him back. He's one of our most popular guests. He's one of the nicest men in the entire world. Friend of ours, friend of the show. Friend of the show. Awesome guy. Bob Usler. Here's our interview with him. You're going to love it. Bob Usler, everybody. All right, now it's time for our guest welcoming back WFAN, longtime WFAN, Mike and the Mad Dog. You know him from. He was the update guy, Mr. Met. Uh, he does Fairfield basketball, what, 35 years now, something like that. Right, Bob? Yes, and- completed my 35th season, yeah. Back by popular demand, you asked, we got him back. Our favorite guest. Bob Usler. Bob, welcome back. I am happy to be back. You flatter me by saying uh, your favorite guest, but uh, I, I enjoy your company. I enjoyed uh, Bob's company when we met for the first time at right. City Field, and I'm uh, glad to keep it going. Hey, we and we've had some big guests, Bob. We've had uh, Westoff, we've had Steve Phillips, and you, you're still our favorite. No question. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. Well, we come from the same place uh, exactly Listen. And we root for this team exactly exactly now all right so now let's let's go this let's is get not this is not yeah this is not the team this is not the conversations we thought we'd be having about this team when we had you on but what a, now what what did, did now since yeah, i have right here since june 2nd they're 4 and 14 they they're, they're hitting 229 the era is 5 uh, they they're pitching to a 5 era what what's got to change with this team? Is it is it big? Because last night looked like a team who was basically uh, defeated. You know, you had Nimmo dropping balls, who's our best defender. You Lindor. Get, you Lindor making errors. It's just it's all over the place. What do you, is this salvageable? I know you're a positive guy. Well, you know, well I am. Po- I'm, listen, uh, the one thing I've always taken pride in is try to take the opposite view of the Mets doomer and gloomer. It's just the way I am because probably because of my age, guys. I. Uh, you know, I came up, I, my first game was 62 in the polo grounds. So I watched them, you know, almost literally in baseball years overnight become world champions. Uh, I mean, seven years, you know, they're, they're having a parade down Broadway for uh, the Miracle Mets. 73, they should have won that World Series. And a lot of people look past, look past 73, which I consider one of the great years in Mets history because they came from last place on August 30th and with one, came within one bad decision of winning the World Series that year. Um, 86, you know, that's unfortunately the majority of fans are too old to remember how improbable uh, a World Series victory that was in 86, or even the win over the Astros in the LCS. So, look, I'm going on and on about my frame of reference, which is I always think that something is going to break in a positive sense. That being said, there's a bad feel about this year's team. And uh, I'd like to remain optimistic, but I think it's like it's whistling past the graveyard at this point. Yeah. We know it can turn. Uh, I think you guys hit upon the key thing what happened last night that indicates maybe where this team is headed. Brandon Nimmo hadn't made an error in two years. The quote-unquote catch probability on Nimmo's and Lindor's blown pop-up, 95%. So there's a 5% chance in both of those situations that those balls will drop in both drop and that's a lack of focus it's a dynamic that's a negative dynamic when you see those things happen a nimmo as you said here's a guy who's become a borderline gold glove center fielder blowing a play like that and then lindor just kind of bailing out and then only bailing out on a catch that could have you know at least kept that game in hand and and it doesn't happen it's bad mojo, guys, and uh, so uh, I'm having a hard time making a good case for this team. That, I'm hoping it turns, but it's tough. Is that uh, is that more on the players, or is that go on to the coaches? Who's going to take the brunt of this bad play? The pitching. Well, ultimately, yeah. Well, ultimately, ultimately, they're all accountable. I'm talking about managers, coaches, and front office. Yeah. Um, the same way that uh, Buck deservedly took his bows last year when. Uh, you know, they won 101 games, and I like Luis Rojas. Uh, just uh, he was somebody you couldn't dislike. I, he was someone who was forced into a situation. He was probably in over his head. Okay, so uh, you correct that, and you hired Buck Showalter, and he was exactly what that team needed last year. 
But for whatever reason, it's going the other way. It's his watch. It's Billy Epler's watch. Uh, these guys are going to pay the price if this thing doesn't turn. It's the same and team. I think it's, it's the same team it, as last year. Like, like, well, I don't understand. It's so weird that, that it's the same team. And it's just complete opposite. I mean, they're making Little League. I said to you last night in an email or this morning, I said, this team's making Little League mistakes. Even when they win, when they beat the Yankees, what is it? how is it possible that there's a play at the plate when the ball hits off the wall and there's a guy on second? Like, what are you doing? Yeah, I was watching that Phillies uh, game last night, um, Bob, and, and I turned to someone and I said, the dynamic of a losing team is as fascinating as the dynamic of a winning team. And you look at the Reds right now. This is a team that doesn't think it can lose a game. Well, the same thing is happening, you know, to the Mets in a reverse sense. That there's a negative dynamic going on right now. So, as you said, and accurately, they're, they're, they look like a Little League team sometimes, the way they're running the bases, uh, not making plays, bad decisions like Pete Alonso running out of the baseline the other day in a game against the Astros. They loaded That's the bases stupid. twice in the first inning with nobody out and couldn't score a run. It's almost impossible, right? <laughs> almost oh, impossible. Man. We've watched it time and time again yet, this season. Yet with the dynamics of a losing team, as I repeat myself, you almost were thinking, oh, they can't not score here in the first inning. But okay. they're thinking the two. And that's the problem. And it's a hard thing to solve. And, uh, you know, it, it, it can turn. Uh, look, look, look at what the Reds have done since Ellie De La Cruz arrived. They're 14 and 2. The now, case. I'm not saying there's an Ellie De La Cruz in the wings for the Mets, but something, whatever, a spark of any kind. Um, 2015, you're when a Cespedes shows up. And look what happens. So, again, I'm not suggesting that that move is imminent or even possible. But my point is something needs to happen that, for whatever reason, sparks this team in a positive way. And if you're a fan of uh, of the team and hoping that something can still happen this year, then it's it's going to take something like that that we don't know. We can't say. Here's what it'll be. No. It just just has to happen. Now, they had... uh, uh Buck held a closed door meeting about what about a week and a half ago. I thought yep. that he shouldn't have held that. I thought it should have been the players only type of meeting. Go in there with just the players because you don't speak your mind. No matter who you are, whether you're on a baseball team or you're working in an office, you don't speak your mind completely when you're when your supervisor or your boss is there. Have the players only only meeting. Curse each other out. Get it all out. You know, have Alonzo or or uh, Scherzer or Verlander call it. Throw some chairs around. Get it all out there. And then go out and try and play. I don't think it should have been a, a coach's meeting. I mean, that, that's just me. Not that anything would have changed or been different. But you're, you're completely right. When, when a team's not winning, when a baseball team especially is not winning, it looks like they're not trying because they're not hitting. They're not doing anything right. But, you know, they're, they're, it's just not going their way. What do you think about the meeting and wh- wh- whether Buck should have helped? Yeah. I, you know, it reaches a point, Bob, where you almost have to hold that meeting if you're the manager because – it's you need to just kind of just draw the line and say, all right, look, this, this is going the other way, guys. And I'm sure, I'm sure the buck, his message was uh, <clears throat> measured, and it wasn't emotional. But the makeup of this team is real interesting in terms of leadership and uh, interaction because you have guys who have been around the block a lot, highly paid guys. You know the names. I mean, you've got sure's a strong personality. Verlander, a uh, multiple Cy Young Award winner with a strong personality. You have Francisco Lindor. You have Brandon Nimmo. Uh, you had Escobar in that lock. On and on and on. And then you have the new guys. Uh, you have the babies, the Alvarez's. You really wonder where the leadership is coming from because these guys can almost, in one sense, self-police but on the other hand, you're really not sure of you know what who the young guys are following. It's it's, it's a mu- it, it's a mess in, in a way when you look at it in terms of uh, who really is in charge here. Buck's in charge, but this is a group. is this a group that needs a manager that gets in your face? Probably not. Uh, but obviously, there's some sort of a void here, leadership void, 
I think they care. I really do think they care. But it's obviously just not translating right now. And uh, it's, it's hard to come up with an easy answer. What What's going to happen now, guys, is you're going to start getting questions about should the Mets seriously consider being sellers at the deadline? And if so, who gets sold? Well, I saw um, there was there was the uh, the former Jim Bowden, the Bowden uh, in the Athletic suggested the Mets should be open to the idea of trading a Scherzer or a Verlander. Brett, Brett thinks that. that. Now, I, I think, listen, I, I think that there's a lot of teams that would be willing to pick up those guys. It may get us out of, if they continue with the pace that they are, um, uh, these contracts may not be looking good for the Mets next year. And if the goal at this point is to rebuild the farm system with some new pitching and still make a push even for this year and for next year, um, it may if you get a good deal, I wouldn't be against it. Yeah, but now what? Okay, okay, okay. I'm with you, Brett. I I I agree with you, Brett. I would uh, again, depending upon how this thing plays out, and as we're speaking here on June 24th before they play the Phillies, you know, if I wake up tomorrow morning and Scherzer has uh, thrown eight innings of uh, you know one run, four hit baseball, and they win the game, I'm thinking, okay, here's the turning point. That's me. <laughs> yeah. But if it keeps going the way it's going. Uh, I would seriously consider uh, moving guys like Verlander or Scherzer or even Starling Marte. Yeah, but now it's it's very interesting. What now? I have never seen it before. I don't know if it's ever been done. The way that the people are talking, he's going to do what what Cohen is going to do is he'll be willing to take your 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 busted big contract. So he'll take a, a Donaldson or a Stanton, and he'll take the contract and he'll cut Stanton. But he'll want. He also wants your best, your best prospects. That's how he seems to be. Have you heard that? What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, you broke up a little bit there, Bob. Okay. So I, I'm, so I think I got the gist of it. Um, or maybe I can just cut to the quick as far as how I think Cohen looks at this. In fact, we know how he looks at it because he's on the record. He did that uh, extensive interview recently with uh, Joel Sherman, where he said. Uh, He's not going to blow up, and he's not going to react to uh, the fans who want him to blow up right now. He is in. They didn't trade prospects in 2022 at the deadline, and if there's one thing they're not going to do this year is trade prospects. They're not going to do it. In fact, the deal they made on Friday night with Escobar going to the Angels shows you where they're headed here. Um, that's the kind of deal, by the way, which doesn't get done if you don't have Steve Cohen's money. Because they're eating the contract, because, right? Yeah. Cohen is picking up not only the remainder of the uh, Escobar contract, uh, which is four or five million, whatever it is. He may also pick up the buyout, which is $500,000, uh, which made the Mets, it put the Mets in a position to get Look, these guys are borderline prospects, but they fill a need. The Mets are sorely lacking in pitching prospects in the, in the system. Now, will these guys develop into bona fide prospects? Maybe, maybe not. But what did you give up? You gave up a guy, Eduardo Escobar, who wasn't playing anymore for the most part. You know, Brett Beatty, you want to develop him? Okay, <laughs> it's his job. Yep. So Escobar odd man out. He goes to a team that needs him because uh, Urshel is hurt and Rendon's hurt, so they need him. You, you, you help him. Good guy. You help him. And he's gone. I mean, you're three months. So, and you get two pitching prospects. That's going to be the philosophy going forward. They need to rebuild the system, especially from a pitching standpoint. Well, that's what I was saying. Is He's going to be, from what I'm understanding, from what I heard the last couple of days, is Cohen's going to be willing to take you know your your guy who's who, who's a, a bad contract. You know, just sitting on your books there, like somebody even like a Stanton or something like that. Not not to that extreme, but we'll take Stanton. Yeah. But we also want your best prospects for for a decent person. Yeah. You know, to and, and then what he'll do is he'll cut Stanton and just pay the money. He'll eat the money. You know. Yeah, I got you, Bob. And again, it, it broke up a little. It's still, but anyway, and that's what Steve Cohen's money. Is I think that's the most val- valuable 
usage of this money. It's going to allow him to take on contracts like that or pay off contracts like Eduardo Escobar's as long as you can do what is his stated goal. His stated goal is to have a system similar to the Dodgers, similar to the Rays, similar to the Atlanta Braves, a system that is you know producing prospects. Um, interestingly, a, a team that until this year has had great sustained success uh, over the last five or so years, Milwaukee Brewers, you hear a lot of talk now about David Stearns waiting in the wings as maybe the Coming next the guy who is uh, who is steering the ship for the Mets. Um, he's going to it's going to take. He's he's sitting out this season. Obviously, the Brewers refuse to uh, release him, uh, but he will be. He's a free agent come this winter. Uh, you know, Cohen uh, smartly you know said when he's approached about Stearns and, and discussing it. He says, I don't. We he has to. He can't say anything about reason. that. No, no, he can't, and he nope. won't, and he's smart not to. But it makes a lot of sense, and uh, I'm not suggesting that this is imminent. But if this season continues the way it's going, or even if it, it doesn't, I can see them bringing on a guy like Stearns, who uh, has a, he's young, but he has a well-deserved reputation of being able to. Uh, to build an organization. Now, I, the big problem, listen, the big problem, and, it, and it's clear as day, it, it, the bullpen is a disaster. And bullpens are generally, I think bullpens generally are unreliable for the most part. But when you have a, a team with a bad bullpen, it's just backbreaking losses that affects the, the fan base, the, 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 the team, the, the players, the organization. Like when you come back from a five run deficit and then they give up a home run like they did on, on the Sunday, last Sunday. Yep. Or, or when you uh, blow games late or in extra innings, and, and it's just terrible. When you're scoring nine, ten runs a game, and you're losing, it's awful. Uh, it's it's really it, they've been all over the place in terms of uh, it's the old cliche, you know, when they're hitting and not pitching, when they're pitching and not hitting. Uh, as far as the bullpen is concerned, well, if you believe in opens, we know the one that uh, we were hit with. The, that that awful night in the WBC. Uh, when, the, you are uh, you not a fan of the WBC, right? You weren't before that. Please tell me you weren't. I, if I showed you the text I sent, <laughs> and I try to be civil when I send out texts to friends, I mean, I was mf in that thing up oh. and down. Uh, I, I, I'm astonished, by the way, as I kind of go off a little bit of a tangent, how the players especially the international players. And then when you get American players who get you know caught up in it, they love it. They love it. That being said, I hate it, and I'll always hate it for one reason, what it did so far to our season with Edmund Diaz going down. Now that's, but did again, that, I'm, I'm but did that really now, is that In hindsight, right, do you look back now and be like, that was the least of our worries? Robertson's been okay. He has been, but it's a, it's a domino effect. If, if you have Edwin Diaz, we have two factors here. Number one, if Edwin Diaz is the closer, then everybody gets backed up a little bit. In other words, Robertson is your great eighth inning guy Definitely. or out of the, you know, depending upon the matchups. Um, and, and I understand what you're saying. Well, you know, Robertson's been good and, and out of being, you know, well, he's been ragged lately. But Edwin Diaz, you know, he's, he's the anchor. And uh, every, but the other factor is, Damn starting pitchers can't pitch length. That's the that's the For biggest goodness problem. Sake. So no matter what, I they mean, would have been just taxed and taxed and taxed. No matter who it is, it just doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's really one. One is as bad as the other. You need starting pitching or starter starters who can go deeper into games, and uh, they begin a little bit more. Look at Senga yeah. last night, and he has you know he has a great pitching performance. I mean, he comes out after and apologizing, trying to take the blame for the pitching performance last night. Not you know after two errors in the field, um, it it's just tough to watch. Even when we get a good pitching performance, this team just blows it. He's it got control. This, it stuff, is. this stuff did not happen last year. Last year, all the breaks went our way. We would get those solid pitching performances. When there was runners on base, we'd get them in from third base, and the bullpen would always step up. And this year, it just seems like every single piece is falling apart. There is not even one thing. It's not Edwin Diaz. It's not the offense. It's not the pitching. It's everything. That's a bad team.
Bad teams, when you pitch, you don't hit. When you hit, you don't pitch. You it, pick it, each other up, and this team just drops each other on the on the ground every single day. Now, real quick, what what it, the real the real victim here in the whole Diaz thing is? What does SNY do with all the cinematography people they hired, and how do they? <laughs> <laughs> And, and what do they do with the money that they're losing from that? <laughs> that, that guy thinks he's Steven Spielberg, doesn't he? That, it's that unbelievable. The, uh, oh, it's yeah, really <laughs> the split but, screens and the yeah. focus and the blur, and then all of a sudden Buck's uh, face pops up in yeah. the ground. Black and white into uh, color. It's incredible. I will leave the fifth on that stuff, but I will say this, and I know we can all agree on this. Most Mets fans, all Mets fans can agree on this. Good, bad, indifferent. Gary, Keith, and Ron oh. are the best. I can watch. I can watch no matter what. It's it really. And, 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 and no matter what's going on, uh, they're going to give. They're going to entertain you, and they're also going to tell you the truth, which is great. You get they get the best of both worlds. You're going to get a good call of the game, and you're going to laugh a few times along the way. Yeah, but, listen, he got he got, he got a he's a, he's one of the best. I met him a couple weeks ago. I met Gary and Ron. Ron, I tried to give my business card to for the for the show. Gary took it, and I was like, "Listen to the show, you know, listen to it, really listen to it." He's like, "Okay, well, I will." Ronnie, I gave it to him. He goes, "No, no, no, thanks." I'm like, "Okay." And as he was walking past me, he goes, "Listen," he goes, "I'm a germaphobe." He goes, "It's not that I don't want to listen to your show. I'm, not, I'm a germaphobe." <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good line. If it's a line, yeah, yeah. Like, Hernandez would just run away from me, probably. You know, that's what he does. But uh, yeah, yeah. Keith is interesting. I actually, in 1999, <clears throat> I was at the Grand Slam single game. And uh, long story short, I had some friends who worked in the Shea Stadium uh, ticket office. So I literally got seats on the field. They were actually, they were folding chairs. They were on the warning, the, the foul line warning track. And uh, so my two sons and a friend were on the field. And we... Um, during about the third inning, we heard this commotion behind us. We look over our shoulder, and Keith Hernandez and his girlfriend, and John McEnroe and his wife, Patty, is it Smythe, were coming down toward us, and people pointing and talking. They end up sitting right next to us in that, <laughs> nice. that special section of the field. I had uh, Patty Smythe near me. Uh, next to me, literally next to me. And if wow. you remember, it was kind of a drizzly day. It was pouring when he hit the home run. Yeah, and it kind of was that kind of a weather day. So I had a scorecard, a little smudged. And Patty Smythe actually wanted me to reconstruct for her the innings that she had missed. John McEnroe wanted nothing to do with anybody. <laughs> really? the Keith Hernandez's girlfriend just sat there and looked like she was enjoying the game. And then Keith, who was behind me, I engaged him a little bit. You know, I didn't want to be a nudge. And he just, he wouldn't shut up. I mean, in a good way. In a good way. It was a constant discourse. Keith Hernandez kept talking. And talk, and, so you, and it wasn't just I. It was other fans who were engaging him for his opinion as this game was uh, moving along. But he didn't and, know who you uh, were. He I, didn't recognize you at all from, from Mike and the Mad Dog or anything? No, no, no. I uh, And I didn't, you know, I didn't say, hey, you know, so-and-so. Um, yeah, yeah. I, but we had, and again, he was the same way during that game on the field as he is in the booth now. He, it's constant discourse. And I found it fascinating. John McEnroe, not as much. And Patty Smythe is an all-time favorite for being a real baseball player. Yeah, McEnroe. I, I, awesome. I think McEnroe is more of a Knicks fan. That's such Knicks a great fan. story. I think he's more of a Knicks fan than he is a, a baseball. He was probably just there. To, you know, he's, he, he likes to be in the limelight. He's more of a spotlight yeah. fan. He's a Queens guy, and I'm sure he likes the Mets. But uh, yeah, I think you're right. It was uh, he's probably there because of the event, and uh, turned out to be a great event. Yeah, it didn't oh, so yeah. well that series. If they had won that damn game six, they're going. Uh, they're yeah. going all the way. Uh, <laughs> and you know what? And that I said because the Braves. I mean, with the Braves, it's just so frustrating because it's every year. It's been it's forever. Me and him, me and Brett were talking. Shay, who is Chipper Jones's son, he's got to be twenty right. something years old now, right? Yeah. So that that that's yeah, yeah. so long. The the Grand Slam single, we we look back as fond and, and a great thing. We lost that series. Yeah. 
It's yeah, we yeah, never yeah, get was, over the break. Some of our greatest moments. I mean, the the Andy Chavez catch and things like that. I look back on. Remember that it was the greatest thing. And I look, I go, I was I was in the front row behind the you know Cardinals dugout for that. And I look back and I go, yeah, but we ended up losing that game. Unbelievable. And how many times? I'll tell you how many times. Ninety nine out of a hundred times when somebody makes a catch like that, you come back and you, and you win the game. Yeah, it was, it was you it. got. It. He got up in that inning, of course, as we know. I, uh, I actually, I, I actually get headaches when I start thinking about this stuff, about that, the way that series ended, the 06. Well, here's what, it, here's what it is. Here's what it is. It's after Tyree makes the catch. Two plays later, Eli throws a pick. Right. Right. Exactly. That's right. what it is. Exactly. It is. It is. Exactly. The great, yeah, goal, perfect the, the great moment happened, but we can't enjoy right. it. Right. Right. Well, I, again, you, uh, you you hold out hope that it, it, it can and will turn. And it will. It will. It, it, will. it will. It will. One day. Now I have faith it will. I didn't. I would not. I did not have faith that it would be happening soon in the last few years. Now I have faith that it's happening. Now, soon. Do you think? Do you think that? Like, because we only know. Like, I was five in '86, so we don't really know Mets championship. You know this. Is it is it different? Do we lose a little bit of the lore if they do when they are when they do win? Like as a Ranger fan, I don't feel like I feel I don't feel like the Rangers lost any of the lore when that curse was broken in '94 because they now they've been bad. You know they haven't won since, but because somebody mm-hmm. sold their soul. But do you feel like the lore, some of the the luster, would be off of the Mets fans because we are the losers? You know the lovable losers. No, 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 and uh, I, it's a it's a very good question, Bob, because I have a lot. Let me live in. Uh, you know, I live in Stamford, Connecticut now, but I used to live farther up near New Haven. A lot of Red Sox fans are friends of mine, and uh, they did actually go through that kind of a now what do we do scenario. You know, now we've broken the curse. Now, what is their identity? They and won a uh, more. they want a lot more. Yeah. I mean, they are actually, again, I don't want to get into a Yankees thing, but if you look at the 21st century, yeah. the, the San Francisco Giants and the Boston Red Sox are the teams of the century, not, you know, not the, uh, the Yankees. Hey, you listen, know, and that was historically. That was the golden age of Boston sports. You had the Patriots, you had the Celtics winning. I mean, that, that was the Bruins won a couple cups. Yeah, and with the Red Sox, you okay, now the curse is lifted, but what happened was now they became what you want the Mets to become, a great franchise. Now they're going through that fallow period again. Uh, you know, I think the Mookie Betts trade is one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. But that being said, the organization is where you want the Mets to be. It's like I don't think either of us will be talking about lost lore if we're talking about four World Series championships. (laughs) Right. It's like you were saying with their identity. It's like now their identity has changed, not the lovable losers or the, oh, it's been so long. It's now they're champions. And now that they have a championship organization, the Mets need that because you need other players to come in and go, oh, no, no, they're not the what we have it all, but it's not happening. They're the champions. And I even relate, I'm a Jets fan to that, and we got Aaron Rodgers coming in to do the same thing. Nothing matters until they win it. But the moment they win that championship, people are going to go, oh, they're a championship organization. Exactly, and then, and then and everything think, changes. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, this this uh, this city is embracing this Mets team now in terms of attendance. You know, I was there last Sunday, uh, that yeah, Father's the, Day, yeah, debacle yeah, against your the grandson, Cardinals. Right? But right, yeah, Bob. It was my uh, grandson's first game, and uh, luckily the cotton candy was good because uh, he had no idea what he was looking at otherwise. <laughs> and that's all he'll remember. Hey, but. Well, you know, I, I look around. There was forty three thousand people in the park, and everybody was having a, you know, despite the bad, even though they won these lousy games, even though they came back and blew. anyway, it, it was, was a great mess. atmosphere. Yep. the fans, the fans are energized now. If this season keeps going the way it's going, well, that energy is going to obviously uh, we're going to lose it. Yet, yet, we, you guys are Mets fans. You, you, Mets fans are ready to, to just basically explode with ecstasy if they can get this thing going in the right direction, which they did last year. And then we end up with the old, and I hate it, same old Mets, you know, same old Jets. Yeah, but why were there, why were there empty seats all over the upper deck then in, in the playoffs last I, year? 
I think because, you know, the whole uh, the, the wild card thing, the watered down playoff scenario, I. I the price, I, the price need, was out of the control. The price was outrageous, too. Uh, I knew I knew three hundred dollars for those upper deck seats, which is out of control. Unbelievable! I mean, even the beer. I, I go to my normal yep. uh, twenty-two ounce uh, Blue Moon, and it's nineteen dollars. I'm yeah. going, give me a break, yeah. would you please? But uh, you know, the price has to, something to do with it. But hey, let's put it this way: if they advance to a division series and in a championship series, wow! I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> believe me, you you find no empty seats anywhere. I, but I kind of got up on a uh, a little bit of a, a tangent there. My point is that we hopefully can look back when we get together on locked up sports again in a few years. Yes. We can look back at 2023 as an aberration, you know, because they have the resources. I think they have some smart people now that are making decisions. And Steve Cohen, I think, has his, has his money in the right place, which is development. Uh, you know, across, I know somebody who works in he's an administrative guy at city field. And he says everything. I mean, and he liked the will ponds, the will ponds hired this guy. I know. And so he had, he had loyalty to the will ponds. There's nothing bad to say about that. But he said under will pond, I mean, under Cohen, he now understands that what he needs, he's going to get. As long as it's fair and as long as he can prove that we need A, B, C, and D to get this done. And I think that is, again, as a fan, it gives me hope that the resources are there and the commitment is there. Now, for whatever reason, this team and its mix, it's just not working and it's embarrassing. Yet you have to hope that because of the commitment and the resources, things will get back on the right track much faster than they have in the past. What do you think about DeGrom? I feel bad for him. Um, uh, you know, I, I obviously uh, they, they made the right decision in retrospect. And if they had brought him back, it would have been at their price. And obviously there also would have probably been something similar to um, what they did with Correa, make him go through a lot of uh, exam- physical examination. But I, to answer your question succinctly, <laughs> I feel badly for him. Um, I mean, he was doing things that just were out of this world. In fact, Bob, this guy was asking his body to do things clearly in retrospect that it was incapable of doing. Nobody could throw that many hundred miles mm-hmm. per hour fastballs and, and wicked sliders and not pay the price for it eventually. And uh, I, I, he was a great Met, and he was in. You know, I was at that Braves game last year when he had uh, when he came back his first home game coming back. Oh yeah, yeah, last yeah. year yep. when he had like the nineteen swings and misses on on the sliders and struck out. That was the, that was the black and white into the color out of the bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> the things we remember, right? What do you think the rest of his career is going to look like? They're saying he might not recover. Yeah, I, again, I defer to uh, the quote-unquote medical experts who say coming back from the second Tommy John is extremely difficult. Obviously, coming back from the first can be done. And sometimes guys actually do better. Um, but at his age, and considering the number of bullets he's already fired, and considering this Tommy John again, difficult. I, I wish nothing. I don't, I don't get any DeGrom hate. And oh, I know there's some people. No. I don't get it. I never have gotten it. Um, he was a he was a class professional. You know, I, I love the way he carried himself. And he's one of those guys. You know, still waters run deep. But here's a guy who burned competitively. I um, mean, you knew this guy wanted to beat you any which way, and most of the time did. Uh, unfortunately, his body betrayed him. And, so I feel bad. Well, he can't. I mean, last night, just just last night, I added another person. I have a list. It's called the former Met, now good list. Uh, we added uh, Tejon Walker to that list last night. DeGrom will never be on that list, you know, because he's uh, his well, best days were with the Mets. Yeah. It looks like, he, it. It looks like he's not. He's, I mean, listen, I don't feel too bad for him because he's sitting on a boatload of money. And he gets every penny, mm-hmm. and that's why if you, you know if you have kids and stuff, you you, you steer them towards baseball because they get every penny as soon as they put that that their name yep. on that contract. 
if you're lucky enough to, to have somebody you are, uh, you know that you're related to or something that, that's good enough, steer them towards baseball. I know football's the glory, but <laughs> football's only you're only is you're only guaranteed your next paycheck two weeks from now in football. But yeah, you know, we had Tejon Walker last night, right? Yep. He, he put that last night. Marcus Stroman, we've Stroman, seen. Stroman, okay. What did you Bassett, think about the Stroman thing? Bassett, a lot of well, guys. Because that annoyed me. That annoyed me. Like, who, yeah, get, get the hell you, out of here. What did, you, did, you, who? did you hear the stat last night? You have four former Met pitchers who have seven wins right now. There's not a pitcher on the current staff that has seven wins. Uh, the, the, the three you already mentioned, Tyron Walker, Marcus Stroman, Chris Bassett. You'll never get the fourth. Because he wasn't a Met very long, but Michael Walker. But he's with oh, I, 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 I did long. hear that. Okay. I did hear that. Yeah, right. Yeah. How long was he yeah, a Met? Seven though? wins. Well, that's well, Isring, uh, Isringhausen. I'll, I'll never forget about Isringhausen. You know, but, uh, Generation K. Yeah, Generation K. <laughs> Isringhausen. Well, I had the poster. Wilson, Isringhauser, and Pulsifer. Yep. And Isringhauser went on to championship teams with the Cardinals, which is another the, – the Mets and the Cardinals are the two disappointing teams because the uh. Cardinals are perennial. You know, you just look up and they're there in the playoffs in the championship series. They have no, you know, no more Molina and uh, what's-his-face is, has clearly gotten old. The pitcher. Why can't I think of his name? Oh, oh Adam Wainwright. Adam Wainwright. Yeah. You know, he's clearly – Because you he want to forget his name. Tied the, Met, tied the Mets up in knots, though. 17 he years later. Best start. Everybody it does. Is. They all show up for the Mets. They all show up. There are, the bro. rookies show up for the Mets. The ex Mets show up for the Mets. If it's there's a rookie in his first day, don't bet on the Mets. It's going to be the best performance of this guy's life. You know, you. I'm sure that your most hated NL rival is the Braves, and yes. that would be for good reason. But I'll give you the two. Uh, and I use the word hate, and I don't like the word. None of us like the word. So it's just, you know, it's sports stuff. Yeah. So I'll it's, use oh, it. like it's frustrating. You, you respect it. You're right. jealous. Yeah, well, the two, my two are the Cubs. I hate the Cubs because they were the first. And you, you never forget the first. I never forget, you know, the 69. Yeah. Uh, Leo, you know, there was that famous moment in 1969, or infamous, if you look at it from the Cubs standpoint. Uh, the Mets played a series. It was the imperfect game that Tom Seaver pitched in 1969 July when he and Jimmy Qualls broke up this perfect Two outs, game right. bid. Right. Well, uh, there was one out. Okay. Uh, which I'll tell you quickly, Bob, what was remarkable about that is he still had to get two outs in that game. And you would have thought his concentration and Seaver bore it down. Anyway, the imperfect game series. So Seaver wins um, uh, that game. They won the next game, must have been Kuzman. Uh, they won the first two. Then there was an afternoon game to conclude the series. And again, the Cubs have a big lead at this point on the match. But, you know, Seaver throws that game, and they win the second game. And then Gary Gentry gets lit up in the third game, and the Cubs win that game. And I asked Leo DeRoche after the game, he said, uh, were those the real Cubs we saw out there this afternoon? And the DeRoche's reply was, no, those were the real Cubs. Mets. Screw you, Leo, and screw the Cubs. <laughs> and I, I look up Bill Hands and what he did to Tommy, to Tommy Agee and what Jerry Kuzman did to Ron Santos in September of that year. I hate the Cubs and I hate the Cardinals. <laughs> uh, again, you guys, uh, again, you, you mentioned, Bob, you were five in 86. I can assure you that that 1985 season, remember the Mets, the Mets, you know, stunk in the early 80s. They were bad in 83. Then in 84, they win 90 games. They start to come around now. And now you're getting, now you've got, you know, Strawberry came up in 83, you know, and, and Keith was acquired in 83, and Gary Carter comes along in 85, and Gooden in 84. Now all of a sudden things are starting to percolate. They win 90 games in 84. And obviously, these days it would have gotten you a wild card. Those days got you, you know, trip home. 85, that Mets Cardinals rivalry was as intense as any single season rivalry I've ever experienced. And obviously, the Cardinals would end up, you know, winning um, the division and going on. Who was and, their manager? Uh, was it Whitey the Herzog? Was the manager? Oh, it was. It was. It was, it was the White Rat. It was yeah. Whitey Herzog. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, he, he should have been the. Uh, he should have been a Met for life. By the way, Whitey Herzog. But don't get me going on that whole thing with Anton Grant and whatever. But it was great stuff. And those those years, 
against the Cubs, against the Cardinals, were intense. I, I intently disliked the Braves, but they are the Bra- Atlanta. I don't take Atlanta seriously as the baseball town. You know, the Cubs are the Cubs. The Cardinals are the Cardinals. These are baseball towns. Yeah. Atlanta. Is it unfortunately they kick our butts every time. every every yeah. year? I, like I said, Shea is twenty years old now, graduating college. I remember when he was being born, and they were like, "Oh, he's good." Because and it's just one generation after the no. next. It just never ends. They can't they're beat right, the Braves. Yeah. Even now, they're just incredible. It's so frustrating. I mean, one freaking one win last year in that series in September. One freaking win against the Braves. Unreal. We win the division, makes Unreal. all the difference yeah, in the it world. Does. It does. It's everything. But then that's another thing that and bothers me about about Buck because now he gets we and we talked about it here on the show. They get swept last two weeks ago, whenever it was, right? And they asked Buck about it. Now we're pissed. You're pissed. We're all pissed as fans. I want to see Buck tear this team up in the press con in, in yep. the post game. Okay, he comes on and he says, "Proud of these guys. Proud of what? Oh, oh it's too I, much." I, it, 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 uh, again, I have these texts on my phone. I'm sure you guys have the same deal with friends who are Mets fans. You need to text back and forth. And I have a text, and there's an all cats proud. Proud, we proud. Of and then you had a lot of the day after the Astros game, the one where he ran out of the baseline. Yeah, and you know well, they loaded was, the bases was, twice what, in the first inning and didn't score. <laughs> I mean, what a de- what a debacle that game was. And then Alonzo the after the game said, "You know, we played well. We played good." I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. You, you, I mean, what? Because you came back and you put up a lot of runs and lost. But he could drop it's an F bomb after he hits a walk off right in front of everybody. Then you got someone like Senga yeah. having a great performance, and he falls on his own sword last <laughs> night. Yeah, 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 he did. I like him. You know, it's too bad. It's on. Look, he's going to be around for a while. Hopefully, we get to see this guy yeah. um, be part of a good, uh, you know, a, a sustained winning team. Uh, although I will say this, Brett, if you look at Senga's face. When that ball dropped behind Lindor, uh, and, yeah, and he, he was wasn't showing up, Lindor. No, but boy, he was, he was like, "Oh, how can you not react like that? That was a bad one." I'm telling you, that was a bad one. There's two he's different guys who could have caught that ball on a routine fly ball, and that thing, nobody talked, nobody said a word, and that thing just dropped. He's that's, got, he's that's got well, unbelievable. Go ahead, Bob. Lindor did. It. I will give him credit for that. He, he said did. because he said he he tells his left fielder. Exactly. So, he says, "If you talk, if you if you call me, I'm out of there. But if I don't hear, it's his, it's all mine." Yep. And he said, and, and, he and so I will say this, you know, Lind- Lindor, because I have friends who, you know, his, their, his nickname from them is three forty one, you know, as in three hundred forty one million dollars. You know, I don't, I don't know how you guys feel about this. I don't care what they're getting paid. Yeah, no, it doesn't they're matter. Getting paid that because somebody's willing to pay that. Yep. I care about performance, and he's underperforming this year. Yet, I do think he has, uh, I hate to use the word mature, because who really knows, but he definitely handles the situations better now here. And, you know, it took him a while, I think, to, to get over the culture shock of moving from Cleveland to New York and understanding the dynamics here. Oh, yeah. But here, this year, uh, look, I doesn't have to talk about uh, owning a play like that. But I think he's handling it much better. He's the nicest guy. From what I understand from what people I know that have dealt with him is he's the nicest guy in in, in just, the world. He's one of the nicest guys in the world. He just wants to succeed. He's second only to you, Bob. Yeah. And he, and he, and <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and what, but what it is with Senga is he – he has control issues. He sometimes he'll walk the ballpark. If he yep. can't get that that yep. that splitter over, or whatever it is you call it, he'll, he'll walk the ballpark. The wrong umpire. Yeah, and that's you know uh, I, I mentioned Tom Seaver before. Uh, he had a um, a cute saying about somebody asked him what's the most important pitch in baseball, and his answer was strike one. <laughs> and uh, Jeremy Hefner has been preaching this. He says we need guys to throw. Strike ones, we because they're constantly falling behind in the count. But obviously, the book is out on Senga, and if the ghost fork is not working, guys are going to be sitting on the other yeah. stuff. And he has good other stuff, but obviously, it, he, it plays off of the ghost fork. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say this: he's boy, did he? I thought he was a goner early in that game. Yep, and uh, he, he found himself and settled in. 
And then he was betrayed by um, yeah, the, the yeah, guys behind him. Yeah, and, and listen, for Hefner, Hefner, listen, regurgitating a 30 or 40-year-old quote is not going to save your job either, just so you know. <laughs> you know, let's, come on. <laughs> strike one. We all need strike. We get it. You need strike one. That's true, yeah. Uh, uh, except, I say uh, that. Went, I'll say that for the league yeah. minimum. Yeah. And then, you know, they uh, he goes out and he, he had Tyler Gill in that Houston game who couldn't throw strike one to save his life. And, of course, after goes out, talks to him, and he remains all over the ballpark. It's, it's kind of season. Right, well, it's, 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 it's the Mets. It's the Mets. What do we expect? Come on. We know who's coming. <laughs> That's what I'm here to combat, yeah. guys. <laughs> hey, you know, listen, Bob, I, I, when I was online before I was looking, I saw that Fairfield gave you a bobblehead, right? About 10 years ago? That is, Where can that we get our correct. hands on one of those bobbleheads? We've got to look on eBay. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, send you one. Do you have it? Do you have any of them? All right. Because we're going to want one in the studio. I, I do. I'd be happy to send you one. Oh, so uh, we'll, we'll come in. Uh, Absolutely. You, you give me the address and uh, it's on. Absolutely. It's on. Absolutely. Well, listen. Hey, listen. If the Mets turn this thing around this year, we need you back for the playoffs. And I know you're an optimism. I, boy, I would. I would <laughs> I, again, as I said earlier, guys. I'll be sitting down, and what is it right now? It's a couple hours yeah, from first pitch. Is it 4 o'clock? Yeah, 4 o'clock. Yeah, 4 or 5. And uh, if Shurs are mows them down and they win this game, I'll be rooting for a, uh, a series win. I'll be there on Monday night in City Field watching them beat the Brewers, and uh, hopefully we can turn this thing around. One game at a time. If we could only all be so optimistic, it would be fantastic. Yeah. Bob, you uh, slept. Yeah, Bob, well, thank you again. Thank you, Thank Bob. you again. Everybody loves you. We love you. Thanks for coming. And we're going to get that bobblehead from him, Brett. Yeah, we are. Let's go Mets. And uh, I will see, we'll see you at City Field, Bob. Thanks for coming on. Same seats, Bob. You know where to find me. You're not in that section. Same. One, uh, 113, row 12, C1 and 2. Please let me know when you're in the ballpark. I'm a awesome. civil servant, Bob. I'm a civil servant. <laughs> I, I, I don't get 113, all right? <laughs> we'll see you there. <laughs> all right, Bob. Right, so. Really, it's great being with you guys. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Thanks again, you. Bob. How about 